Welcome to the Arctic. Well, I see the brave souls have made it this morning, and uh, we're glad you're here. We do need to be praying. Uh, there's still a lot of folks who are, not all of them have COVID, but that, that is certainly around, and uh, the people are recovering from that, and we need to be just remembering that uh, our God is faithful, and He helps us to get through whatever struggles it is that we're facing. And certainly uh, this, this uh, winter has been uh, a season of challenges and difficulties. So uh, we certainly want to be praying for those folks. And as was mentioned, uh, the Rothrocks are recovering, and uh, I'm sure we'll be back next week. So uh, we're grateful that they're doing well and uh, seem to be uh, more than holding their own at this point. So. Well, uh, last week was kind of unusual, wasn't it? A little different, and uh, we had the opportunity to share with you from home. And while that was interesting and it was uh, its own kind of uh, challenge, I'm glad that we're back today. Uh, I know that folks are watching online, and that's a wonderful ministry that God has given us, but it, it's never been intended to replace what we're doing today. Getting together into God's house and sharing together in the worship and fellowship of the Lord, uh, there's no substitute for that. And so we're glad you're here and we appreciate the opportunity to share the word with you today. So uh, before we begin, let's just pause and ask God's blessing upon our time together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to delve into the word of God. We appreciate so much the time that we had this morning in the Word with Pastor Tim in Sunday school, and I just am thankful that, that we have the faithful Word of God being taught and preached in our ministry. And so we again this morning ask for your guidance and direction and all that is said and done. We know that uh, times are changing very quickly around us, and sometimes it's hard for us to even keep up with these changing times and all of the things that are happening. But as we look again this morning at the things that you've told us in your word that we should be aware of and alert to that uh, are the things that will come before, that will pre pre preview the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we ask for your blessing as we consider more of these signs and the way they are impacting our lives is amazing. We thank you for this and ask your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would this morning, if you would open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 24, just to begin here. Matthew 24 is, again, one of those areas that uh, deal with some of these signs of the time, so to speak. Uh, In Matthew 24, beginning in verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. When shall these things be? And what shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquake in diverse places. All these are the beginnings of sorrow. It goes on to describe many of the situations that will take place before the Lord's return. Now, it's important for us to understand that there are two events in the Scriptures we often refer to the Lord's return. 
The one is, is actually the rapture of the church, where we will be caught up, 1 Thessalonians tells us, we'll be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That is not technically the Lord's return. The Lord's return comes at the end of the tribulation period when He will actually return to the earth, He'll return to the Mount of Olives, and He will establish His thousand-year kingdom at that point. So when we talk about the end of time as we know it and we talk about the changes that we're seeing, there is actually uh, at least a minimum period of time of seven years between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. And so that seven-year period that we call the tribulation period is filled with many of the sorrows and many of the struggles that are going to be falling upon the earth. It is a catastrophic time, unlike any other time in human history, where judgment will fall upon the earth because of their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ and because of their uh, adoption of the Antichrist <clears throat> and His rule. And so when we talk about this scripture and others like it, we are, we are really talking about a time in the future when these things will be evident. However, he says something interesting. He says, these are the beginnings of sorrows. You see, that seven-year period is the time of sorrow. But there are things that we will see in advance of that time that I believe help us to understand the nearness and potential uh, soonness of the rapture of the church. I think many of you remember the time that we had recently with Dr. George Matsko. And uh, he was a great, he and his wife were wonderful. We had him in the school, we had him in our church. They did a lot of scientific things. And he was just a, a really remarkable man. Sandy, I had the opportunity to have him have lunch with them. Just a, a sweet couple. And his ministry, of course, is going around and uh, helping people to understand that uh, the Bible is true that science has not conflicted with the Bible, that evolution is a pipe dream, some of those kind of things, and I'm putting that very succinctly. Recently, he posted on Facebook. I happen to be a friend of his on Facebook. I like to read what he posts. By the way, if, if you got something from me on Facebook, it wasn't me. Uh, people just grab your name and start sending out things. Uh, I, I, somebody said that I, I had won a lot of money. That's not true. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you, but uh, nobody, nobody's given me any, any great sums of money, so uh, you can just get rid of that. And it, well, they were notified, so I just wanted to say that for any of those that are listening out there that might have got that attempt at fishing. But Dr. Metzko recently posted in a very straightforward post, he said, the time is short. And then he went on to reiterate the importance of people accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You know, all that we're going to talk about today, it can be uh, an encouragement to our hearts. It can be, uh, hey, as a believer, the idea of Christ's return, I, I'm all for it. How about it? Amen. Yeah, I, I think uh, 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 that's something that even if we don't understand all the implications of it, it, it will be a wonderful thing. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, you know, caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This body shed for a new glorified body. What a, what a, what a trade-off that's going to be. Amen. But as we underline these truths that we're going to look at this morning, we looked at last week, probably look at again next week. I think one of the, the, the great things that the Spirit of God wants to stir up in our hearts is the people around us that don't know Jesus Christ. The ones that have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. It is imperative that we pray for them, that we're looking to their life and for the opportunities to share Christ with them. I believe that all of these great signs of the times are one of the things that God wants to use in people's lives to convict them about their need of a Savior. You know, there was years ago a movie, Left Behind, and there's been other times when um, there's been attempts at depicting what it's going to be like. 
after the rapture of the church in that tribulation period, uh, I'm guaranteeing you, nobody has that right. Nobody can really understand how devastating, how horrible this situation will be when the Lord Jesus Christ is bringing us out of here. One of the things that happens is that the Holy Spirit, His restraining influence on the world is taken away. Ephesians said, He that now letteth will let. In other words, the Holy Spirit is restraining evil today. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Think of that. What would this place be without His restraining influence? You don't want to find out, do you? No, I don't. I don't want to find out. And so one of the things that happens when we're raptured, it's not that the Holy Spirit won't be working in this world. He certainly will. There will be people actually get saved during the tribulation period. You have the 144,000 witnesses. And they're, they're going to be out there, and they're going to be witnessing to all of the people of the world. They're given supernatural abilities to speak the languages and all those kind of things. But listen, without the Holy Spirit's restraining influence, Satan is going to be able to bring to fruition all of his evil plans and desires for our world. So one of the great underlying things that we need to realize is that this is a time for us, while the Holy Spirit is here, while he is convicting men, to be praying and evangelizing and teaching people about the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things that we see. They are the, the prelude to the rapture of the church and the unfolding of the traumatic events that will happen during the tribulation period. Now, this morning, I wanted to, to mention that we have our new updated list uh, it's pretty extensive. Back in 2009, I began looking at scriptures and, and the Bible and some of the indicators that were there and uh, taking a look at our, our current events and, and the world in which we're living and seeing how these things uh, compare to what's going on in our world today, how they might give us insights into what we might expect uh, as things progress. We looked at that last week from Daniel 12:4. Many shall run to and fro. Uh, we talked about how the world is going to become smaller in terms of transportation and diseases. And the second part of that is that knowledge shall increase. My goodness, friends, we have watched it with this COVID. It starts somewhere in Africa. Somebody hops on a plane and they're here. They're in Europe and comes with them, doesn't it? This world has gotten so much smaller and... One of the problems with that is that whatever they catch in Africa or any other part of the world, it's, it can be days or even hours until that comes to us and begins to spread. And when you get something like this COVID, for which there was no natural immunity, it spreads like wildfire, doesn't it? You see, that, that is something that I believe the Bible indicates we're going to see more of and not less. So... There are some of these that I want to look at this morning. Uh, we're not going to cover every one. Some of them are pretty self-explanatory, and uh, I think you can see them happening quite clearly on your own. But we're going to look at uh, some of these scriptures as we kind of bring them up to date, some of the things we're seeing now. So let's go to Matthew 24. And I want to just uh, read what we had here. Uh, he said, wars and rumors of war, watch for conflicts to increase worldwide. And that was in 2009. I think we have seen a lot of that uh, kind of thing increasing. And, uh, of course, in, in the, the uh, text that we're looking at in uh, the verses 2 to 8, we have that with uh, the last part being uh, in verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you need not be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, during the tribulation period, one of the first things that happens during the, the original seals, you know, there's a seven-sealed judgment, and one of the first seals that is unleashed during that period of time is what most people look at as World War III. 
uh, it could be named whatever you want to name it, but there will be a world war. When you look at what's going to happen to this world when Christians are taken out of it and the Holy Spirit's restraint is, is released, what is going to happen is the chaos that will ensue is going to break out into worldwide conflict. The, the leadership vacuum that will happen as America stops being the worldly dominant power for as much good as you can find in the world today, it still rests in America. We use our power for good still. And if you take that out of the way, what's going to happen? First of all, I don't know how powerful America will be after the rapture. There's a, there's a lot to be said for the, the Christians that are involved in our military and in our power structures in our country. You take them out of the way and chaos is going to unleash itself. But even as you look today at some of the things that, that we ought to pay attention to as Christians, right now there's a situation unfolding uh, where Russia is really asserting itself again in, uh, in what was the former Soviet Union. I just uh, read in an article uh, this week that uh, Russia is poised on the border of Ukraine and in an, they are absolutely ready, at least potentially, to, to move in and take over. They have about 150,000 troops. And actually, if you look at how Ukraine is situated, the Russian troops are strategically placed on three sides. They, they are in Crimea. They are on the Russian border on two different sides. Now, there's a lot of talk and negotiations going on and all of that kind of thing. But if they invade the Ukraine and we do nothing, which I think is going to be the case, I think that we will not do anything. I, I hate to think of that. But you, are, you and I are looking at an expansion of the Russian military that can have worldwide impact. And so whether you like it or not or whether I like it or not, we know that Russia plays a big role in the end times. And so it should not surprise us that wars and rumors of wars are in part going to encompass Russia and its uh, particular brand of socialism and communism. So I think that is one that is certainly being fulfilled today. We see the conflicts worldwide, not only from Russia, but all over the world. There are sectarian conflicts that are happening, tribal conflicts in Africa, it is a very unstable world in which we find ourselves today. We are, we are relatively uh, unscathed by it in this country. Again, I go back over and over again when I look at the things that are happening in our world. And so much of it we are escaping. I, we're not necessarily happy with what's happening in our country, but we are, we are escaping the worst of all of this. And I, and I honestly believe it is because of the Christians in this country. I believe that God is sparing us because of people like you who love Him, who worship Him, who honor Him. And I think that uh, the minute we're taken out of this place, America is going to change instantly. There are pressures to change us now. There are, but there is a restraint of the Holy Spirit. and We don't know how far that will go in our lifetime. Another of the things that greatly concerns, I think, all of us, is uh, number four on our list. Watch for the increase in natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, disease, and famine. The world's food supply and the ability of people to feed themselves is under attack. Perhaps right now, today, there are more people struggling to be fed than at any other time in modern history. America remains the breadbasket of the world. You and I, 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 I know we can't conceive of the fact we can go to a local grocery store and we can fidget and fuss over what variety of vegetable we want. You know, you can get vegetables from all over the world and we can get produce and all kinds of food. We, we, we can get whatever cut of meat or beef or whatever you want. 
and it's an incredible thing in this country. But that's not the way it is in the majority of the world. People in the world today are hungry and starving and having struggles to find basic food. And I'll, I'll promise you that if you investigate this, you will find out that America is doing more to feed the world than any other country. Thank God for that. But what's going to happen? What's going to happen when these famines increase and maybe the food supply in our country gets touched? I'm concerned about that. I see a lot of things happening to our food supply. And so far, we've been able to stay a little bit ahead of them. But you know what? God says the beginning of sorrows, one of the things that's going to be touched is the, is the food supplies. If you go back in the Old Testament, Chronicles talks about it in 2 Chronicles. One of the things that God does to get people's attention is famine. Famine has been a part of God's judgment upon the world from the earliest times that we can understand. Famine is designed, you know, when you have an empty stomach, you become desperate. And people begin to turn to God in a way that perhaps they don't in any other time. I recently read that May 6, uh, 2021, acute hunger is at a five-year high. Now, this was back in 2021. And a study warms, warns that famine looms for millions of people in Africa. The World Food Program estimated that there are 45 million people at risk of famine across 43 countries. We don't even see it, do we? We don't talk about it. We don't, we don't have any impact from it other than sometimes we'll see an ad on television and it touch on the heart and we might want to give some money toward it. And there are wonderful organizations in America that are doing the yeoman's work to try to get this food out to people. But God says it is a sign. It is going to be more and more prevalent as the day approaches. Why not America? Again, I think God has, has blessed us in amazing ways. One of the things that I wrote about in 2009 was from Luke chapter 17. If you want to turn there. Is everyone comfortable here today? Because it's really hot up here. <laughs> so I'm hoping that you're comfortable. Wow. You know, whenever we built this, they put a, they put a vent right there, and it's like, Whoa. In Matthew, excuse me, I say Matthew, I meant Luke. Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 30. And we've quoted this many times. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they brought, bought and sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man revealeth. One of the things that we know from the days of Lot was Sodom and Gomorrah, don't we? And the judgment of God fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah because of their promiscuity, their sexual perversion. I think that as we see this day approaching, we are not going to see less of that, but more. When I wrote this in 2009, it was just really beginning. But look at where it's gone in these few years. Back in 2009, we, we said uh, 
that we should watch for aggressive political, religious, and social pressure to accept homosexuality, especially in the area of marriage and making of homo homosexuality a protected class and granting minority status. It's all happened, hasn't it? When you attack marriage, one of the fundamental truths of the scriptures, and you, you pervert it for whatever reasons, and when it becomes a politically accepted and socially accepted norm, look out. Because God has said clearly that he will not tolerate that. I don't know what it's going to do and how it's going to change. I just know this. When I hear all of this, even what I've said today, they could take this down in a minute. That's fine if they do. I'm not going to stop saying what needs to be said. And that's why it's important to be here. <laughs> there's, no, there's no guarantee you're going to hear it out there. We have social media that is censoring people. It's, it's crazy what's happening in our world today. But just mark this down, folks. I don't even have to explain it much. You've seen what has happened over these years and how now when you speak about these things, there is no such thing as free speech anymore. I uh, don't know who said it. I tried to find out who said this. I thought it was an amazing quote. What someone recently said, that when a conservative speaks, it's hate speech. And when a liberal riots, it's free speech. <laughs> I thought that really defined where we're going in the world today. You can speak the truth, but that's hate speech. You can riot, but that's free speech. I don't know. The world is being turned on its head. How much, how much more will we see? Dr. Machiko said, the time is short. I don't think he's alone. I certainly believe that we are seeing things ripen in our world today at an unprecedented rate that really does belie the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The next thing that I wanted to point out is from Luke 21 and 2 Timothy 3, where it speaks about how we will be hated. I don't like to be hated. I like to be liked. How about you? <laughs> I, don't hate, I don't hate anyone. You know, people talk about, oh, you hate homosexuals. You're, no, no, you love them. You pray for them. You want God's blessing on their lives. But you know that the only way that happens is just like it had to happen for us. We had to get saved. We had to repent of our sins. And we had to come to Christ. And so it is that uh, they can try to make it sound like we hate, but we don't hate. In Luke 21, I'll get there. Hey, there it is. Luke chapter 21. Verse 17, just very succinct. He says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. He was talking to his disciples. I think that had implications for the Jews. They have certainly seen their share of hatred through time. But we have watched as being a Christian is bringing us into greater and greater conflict uh, with the world at large. I've thought a lot about how this conflict might develop. Christians tend to be very law-abiding citizens. We want to live peaceably with all men, certainly within the conduct and confines of our government. We want to respect our government. We want to, we want to be good citizens. But I don't think that will be enough in the end. I think my heart and mind went back to Daniel <laughs> and how the developing changes in Daniel's culture led him into conflict, unavoidable conflict with his governmental ruling body. It's in Dan Daniel chapter 6, and 
we don't need to turn there this morning, but you know the story of Daniel. But to summarize it, there were those that were in his kingdom. Daniel was promoted. He became next to the king. He was number one. He was number two in the nation. And there was jealousy amongst others who felt that they should be in that position, I guess. But this jealousy and this hatred for Daniel really fomented. And they got together and began to try to find some way to get Daniel in trouble, basically. They couldn't find anything. He was, he was a model citizen. He was honorable. He was loyal to his laws and his king. And they finally came to the conclusion that the only way that they were going to be able to get him <clears throat> was concerning his God. And so, <clears throat> through deception and subtlety, they got the king uh, by pl playing up to him and his pride. They got the king to make a decree, which is the same as a law in our world, that you couldn't pray to anyone but the king and you couldn't pray to anyone but him publicly. Oh, you could pray to anyone, just had to pray to the king and he had to be the one supreme in that time. And so it was that Daniel found himself in the place where he had to make a choice. His, his habit was to pray facing Jerusalem three times a day. His prayers were to his God, and he had allegiance to no higher cause or purpose. And so in the end, he continued to be faithful in doing what was right. And of course, he was thrown into the lion's den because of it. Now, thankfully, God was involved in all of that. And like his predecessors, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who also faced the same kind of conflict, uh, were delivered from the fiery furnace, so Daniel was delivered from the mouth of the lion. We have to make up our minds because I think this is where the, the challenge is going to come. I've seen tests of it recently. You have too. There are going to be tests of our culture. Not always laws, but they'll come down as rules or regulations coming out of the bureaucracies that will have the impact of law. They, they had in this last, you know, shut your church down. You can't go to church. It didn't last very long because once we realized what they're about, we started going to church again. You know what? That was just a test. How loyal are we going to be to God and His Word? How will we stand up for the truth, even in the face of not just public shame, but even imprisonment? I'm glad they don't have lions. I hate big cats. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, that wouldn't be a, a pleasant prospect, would it? But our God is able to deliver us and will deliver us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God will deliver us. They understood, maybe we'll die, but we will have been delivered. <laughs> and so we see that there is a growing danger of our culture changing rules and regulations and laws so that we will come into more and more conflict because of our faith and our adherence to the directives of God's Word. There can be no higher power than God in our lives. And when those powers that be challenge our faith and trust in Christ and our belief in Him and the obedience to His Word, I am afraid that is where much of the future conflict will arise. It's always been the case. Another one that I think is very significant for our day is... Number eight, which says, watch for churches to become more emotionally driven. God's word and doctrine will take a backseat to entertainment and political correctness. Apostasy will increase. We are seeing spiritual erosion on an alarming level today. We cannot help but see the church of Laodicea. We just studied that. The lukewarm church, the church that was rich and thought they had everything. But spiritually, they had nothing. They were blind and naked. Today, 
So much is going on in our country that just causes me great concern. Our churches are becoming more and more driven by the secular kinds of ideals and attracting people by them. It's interesting that there's a scripture that talks about having the form of godliness but without power. And I'm afraid that's de just describing more and more. Here's something that's very scary to me. I went back and looked at the whole Holocaust and how it took place. Now, obviously, there's so much there that you could study that the rest of your life. But the Holocaust, where millions of Jews and Christians were put to death, is one of those dark stains on humanity that if we ever forget is going to be one of the saddest days that we ever have because we will repeat it. Did you know that Article 24 of the Nazis' manifesto was designed to give religious freedom under Nazism? Interesting, isn't it? You should look it up. You can uh, find it in the Encyclopedia of uh, the Holocaust, encyclopedia.ushmm.org, if you want to take it <laughs> as a place to start. The, the terrible fact is that when Nazism came to power, most of Germany was Protestant Christian. They were the largest minority, a majority of religions in Germany. There were about 40 million of them. There were about 20 million Catholics and then some other smaller groups. What took place was the exchange within Protestantism. Now, there were those who rebelled. There were those churches that, that definitely stood against what was happening. And many of those Christians paid with their lives. You have great stories of those who tried to rescue Jews who were involved in trying to deliver them from the impending death. And most of those were, at least many of them were Christians who saw the danger of what was happening. But what happened to the majority of the Christians in Germany was that they became enamored with nationalism. They called themselves the German Christians. And they adopted the anti-Semitic um, ideals of the whole Third Reich and believed that Judaism or the Jews were the big problem. And so they literally went along with what was happening because they were good Germans. What's it going to be to be a good Christian in America pretty soon? You're going to have to agree with all of this stuff, aren't you? They will claim that there's going to be religious freedom, but this Article 24, the catch in it is this. It states that you can have any religion you want as long as it is subservient to the national interest. As long as it succumbs to the ideals of Nazism and is not a threat to, to the state, it can exist. Can you see that happen in our country? I can very easily. I can see that our country is already pushing for that political correctness to impact our ability to have schools and churches and to, to openly and out of conviction of heart and faith worship God as He has taught us to do so. It made me very, very sad to think about millions of Christians standing by idly as their brothers, fellow Christians, and Jews were slaughtered in the gulags and concentration camps. Spiritual erosion is not a small thing. And we've watched the church in America become rich, powerful in its own right. We have, we've watched it become adorned with all of the tapestries of our culture and our society. They have a form of godliness, but where is the power? 
40 million Christians in Germany could not stop Nazism. They could have. With one voice, it would have been silenced. But they embraced it or were simply silent in the face of it. What will it look like in the time before the Lord's return? You can watch for this to increase. Your road as a faithful Christian could get a lot bumpier before it smooths out because the challenges we're facing are very real. I know we don't like to think about it. We don't like to talk about it, but we need to think about it. We need to make up our minds of what faithfulness looks like and our willingness to pay whatever price is necessary in order to stand true to the Word of God. Today, there are many things. I looked at uh, number nine on this. <laughs> we talked about how in the last days, there is going to be a tremendous amount of sorcery, wizardry. The whole area of forbidden practices in the scriptures will become commonplace and normalized. Is that happening today? I mean, we have changed the word warlock, which is a male witch, which has a very negative connotation. You know, you call somebody a warlock, I mean, <laughs> that would be a very... But if you call them a wizard, they can star in the most popular movies as heroes. We have, we have come a long way in normalizing the acceptance of the dark arts and creating an environment in which they are actually admired by some. In the last times, in the book of Revelations, after all these judgments, one of the powerful verses says that they won't give up their sorceries. <laughs> they become so enamored with this. Let's face it, when Satan comes on the, the scene as the Antichrist, they will have in him the ultimate expression of their faith. That's, my friend, a growing, growing reality. We need to teach our children that it's not an innocent, playful pastime. It's not just a fun thing that people can dabble in. It leads to terrible consequences. And uh, for those that dabble in it, sometimes uh, irreversible harm to their lives. I say all of this this morning. These are things that I see happening. I said the first thing that it ought to motivate us to do is to uh, be looking around and praying for those that are lost. Part of what we have sacrificed with COVID has been our sense of being able to get together. Uh, recently, and I know this is happening because it's not the first time, someone told me that uh, the seven-day Adventist, I don't know who else might be doing this, uh, they, have, they have stopped going door to door because of COVID. But now they're doing mass mailings to people into homes. Have any of you gotten them? Yeah, some of you have. And these mailings, uh, of course, are very, uh, very innocuous. They, they certainly don't reveal themselves to be the cultish group that they are. But they invite you to read the letter, to give them a call. Uh, and they're reaching out. And the deceptiveness of our day is not going away. But I think it's very interesting that we as Christians who have the good news, who have the opportunity to speak the truth, uh, are not doing as much. We have to become innovative and creative and begin to find means by which the gospel can be shared. I know we're doing one this morning. We're certainly broadcasting our Sunday school lessons and our church services. We broadcast our Wednesday morning service, but we mostly reach Christians during this time. I would say that probably 99% of the people who watch these broadcasts are individuals who have somehow had a past association or a present association with our ministries. We need to think about that. The second thing I think that really needs to be on our hearts and minds is how does this look 
for me personally? What, what is the implications of this for me in my life? I, I don't know how much time we have. I really don't. Anybody that tells you know the exact time, they don't know. We don't know if it's going to be a day, a month, a year, 10 years, a thousand years. <laughs> I don't think the thousand years is probably it. But I can tell you this, we have things happening today at an alarming rate. And if you go through this list and it's published for you, you can take it home and study it. I think you will, in your own world, discover so many of these things that you've noticed and that you've seen, but maybe you haven't seen their connection to the Scriptures. This needs to motivate us. This needs to motivate us. He says, occupy till I come. This is not the time for us to sit back and say, oh, well, the Lord's returning. I'm just going to kind of be a placeholder till he gets here. We have to look at the future. I think if the Lord returns tomorrow, I think we should be planning. I believe God's word encourages us in this, that we should be planning for the future and the means by which we can fulfill his mandates upon us and for us. Lastly, if there is anyone today that is listening that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, I hope that you will realize this is not a time to delay. This is not a time to put it off for another day. This is a time to take seriously all of the evidences that God has given you of His soon return. You do not want to be here having heard the gospel of Jesus Christ rejecting it when Jesus Christ returns. Oh, how we need to know. Your loved ones and friends, they need to know that you're okay with God, that you've trusted Him. What a tremendous blessing it is as family members to know that our family has trusted Christ. Talk about it with your family. Talk about it with your extended families. Don't just let the conversation fall idle. Realize that this is a day to have honest and frank conversations about salvation and about the need of Jesus Christ. There are so many more of these things that are here. Biblical predictions of how things will unfold as it gets closer and closer to the return of Christ. I think any student of God's Word is becoming more and more aware that we are living in unprecedented times. I know it's been evil before. There have been difficult times before. But the way these things are unfolding today, not only in America, but on a worldwide scale, it certainly gives us an encouragement that Jesus Christ's return is eminent. I hope and pray that you will be motivated in your life because of these truths and that you will allow them through the Holy Spirit of God, to push you forward to new heights of love and service. Let's pray. Father, as we have pondered these few things today, we realize that these are just the beginning. There's so much more that happens. The 21 judgments that fall during the tribulation period are beyond anything that we have ever seen or witnessed in, a, in any kind of human history. Nothing perhaps other than the flood, which was the total annihilation of humanity, save for Noah and his family. Nothing short of that has ever been experienced in our world like that which will be experienced. The Antichrist will have his way to some degree, but no, he will not win. He will not win, nor will his followers win. You have told us how it ends. And so, Father, help us to be faithful and true and live our lives carefully in respect of your soon return. We love you, Father. We thank you for your word, and we ask your blessing now. In Jesus Christ's most precious name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.